for tonight, what I'd like to do is talk about, uh, my preach is entitled Revolt and Redemption. Revolt and Redemption. We, we sit with an incredible message in our hearts. An incredible message from the Bible that the world needs to hear. It, overriding this, this uh, COVID-19, overriding what's going on in the world right now, is a bigger story that's been going on for thousands of years. And I think, if anything, this story is brought to life by the need mankind has right now. The fact that there are things beyond people's control. People are fearing the fact that at any given moment they could get a disease that can have one of two things. Either it can make you sick yourself or you can pass it on to someone and make them sick in an unintended way. We can't control the spread of this virus. Even though people have warned us for many, many years that viruses are on the increase and that when we become one world, what's going to happen is those things can spread very, very, very quickly. Now, we know that, but we weren't ready for it. And so people, quite honestly, are freaking out right now because they can't control their environment. I want to just remind you, we haven't been able to control our environment from the day we were born. From the day you were born, you had no control over what your parents did and didn't do to you, over the color of your skin, over where you lived, over the language you would speak. None was given to you. You just had to grow up in an environment and do the best that you could in what you were given, isn't it? When a person's heart stops or a person has an aneurysm or anything happens, you don't predict, you don't know it's happening, you don't put your affairs in order because you know something's about to happen, you just carry on living. We are actually out of control all the time. That's why I remember in the old days you watched movies like Speed. And Speed 2, you know, it was first it's a bus and then it's an airplane and now Speed 3 is the virus. No, not an airplane, it was a ship. Hey? Now it's Speed 3, freak out or whatever it's, you know. And the reality is we live in an environment right now where almost anything is out of control because you don't know what's happening next. People have issues and things that happen to them all the time. But when we go to the scriptures, we find a constant that has been true for millions and millions of people over thousands of years. And in a time like this, the one people that should be as strong and as stable as anything are the people of God. Because we are secure. We keep telling the world, we know Christ the healer. We know the answer. We know this. Then sickness comes, strikes the church. You soon see who really is the church and who isn't. Doesn't take long. It's amazing how quickly you either respond in the flesh or in the spirit, isn't it? I had a dream. And again, dreams are very, very subjective. Is that all right? But I, and I do not dream very often, that's for sure. But I had a dream the other night and I said to Vanessa, it was a horrible dream. So let me tell you. I was taken into a building, one of the most famous churches in South Africa. I was invited there. So I arrived in the side door, thousands and thousands and thousands of seats. And there were about 200 people gathered in the building. Lights were dim. And the preacher got off the stage and walked down and someone grabbed his pulpit and he put his pulpit there among the people and spoke to the 200. And he wasn't bothered at all by what, he, what was happening. And I know that this church runs multiple meetings, but thousands in every meeting. But the guy wasn't worried. He stood and spoke to his 200 people. And, and when I woke up, I, it was really bothered me. And I spoke to the Lord and I said, what is it? And it was just when this virus was coming. And, and I felt the Lord say to me, you know, Full buildings do not indicate a full church. Because not everybody who goes to church is actively part of the church. Not everybody who brings a Bible, puts a smile on their face, lives a pure heart before the Lord. When persecution comes, when pressure is on, when things don't work, you soon see what's revealed in a man's heart, isn't it? It's only under pressure. It's only sometimes under extreme pressure you can discover. And remember the old toothpaste principle. When you pull, or when you squeeze a toothpaste tube, only what's inside comes out, not something else. So when you're in crisis, the things you say, remember the Bible says, whatever you talk and you whisper about there will be spoken out there. Because God listens, and God also says the measure you use will be used against you. 
And we've got Christians who behave in certain ways, make opinions, judge, criticize, say things, etc., not realizing that God will pull them to account for that very thing. And I want to tell you, now is not the time to be sucked into a demeanor of fear. This is a major issue. But we as Christians need to know the same Christ who was Christ before coronavirus is the same Christ who sits on his throne today, who has absolute authority, knew this was coming, and knows what life beyond it will look like. Are you okay? Our conduct, our actions, like with anything, will be reflected. And what will be reflected is what's in our hearts anyway. Same as any crisis one goes through. So the passage I want to use is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. I've got 10 points. How many points do you think I'm going to get through? Yeah, one. So I've got 10 points, so let's go. My passage I want to read is Hebrews chapter 8. Jonathan, it's great to have you with us tonight, bud. Jono is running the New Day Primrose. It's doing so well. He's uh, given them a, day off, a night off tonight, which is wonderful. So he's able to come and join us. Great to be with you. We're talking about trying to do a pulpit swap in the next little while. We're trying to get our diaries in order. We'll see how that works. Uh, great to have you with us, bud. I want you to know, though, that somebody got hold of me on Facebook this morning and said, listen, you've got New Day Primrose. You've got New Day Eastrand. You've got, where's New Day Germiston? Today. A guy got hold of me and said, can you start a new day in Germiston, please? I said, well, we're just waiting for someone to put their hand up, so uh, keep praying for us. I, I really did say that. All right, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. The point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Right there is a bold declaration in Hebrews chapter 8 that we have a high priest. We know the point of a high priest is to represent man to God and God to man. We have a high priest who sits next to the majesty, which is God the Father, at his right hand, which is the seat of power. And he's in the sanctuary and he ministers. He serves. Who does he serve? Us toward God. The true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. So right away, we need to know as the church, we have one who represents us in the highest place of all highest places, and he's there right now, and he's doing something. So point number one is this. It is the Lord who unites all Christians, or who should anyway. It is the Lord. If there's one thing every Christian has in common, it's the Lord. And can I say this? If the Lord is the litmus test by which Christians are assessed, the role of the Holy Spirit is to make each one of us, as we are transformed from one degree of glory to another, it is the Holy Spirit's job to make each of us a bit more like Jesus. And so the older you get in the faith, now hear what I'm saying. If you've been saved two years, you're allowed to be a bit of a nincompoop. Is that all right? Your mind's still getting renewed. There's a whole lot of adjustment that needs to happen. But if you've been saved 5, 10, 20, 30 years, you should be, like, hear me, and I say this unapologetically, you should be the most Christ-like person in this room. When you're listening or you're watching right now, you should be the most Christ-like person. Your attitudes, your words, your speech, your conduct, that which comes out of you should be that which most represents Jesus because you've walked closest to His Holy Spirit for the longest. But what you know what the church allows today? We allow older people to become miserable, to become fleshly, instead of saying, actually, we want to call you to account because you're supposed to be showing us how to live. I'm still a young man. And I will keep saying that. But I am still a young man. And my role is to look for role models who have walked with Jesus longer than me, who are showing me that their lives reflect more of Jesus, that I can become more like them. And what is it that joins, say the person who's ahead of me in their walk with the Lord, and the one who's behind me in the walk with the Lord. What is the unifier between all of us? It is the Lord Himself. And I mean, humanity is sliding down a slippery slope. Do you agree? I just say this, I'm not commenting on it, I'm just making the statement. 30 years ago, the LGBGHT whatever discussion was not a discussion. Today it's on the table. My kids are aged 14, 12, and 9. And my three boys are going to handle issues, moral issues, in the next 10, 20 years that we haven't even thought of yet. We don't even know what's coming. Humanity is on a slippery slope. Do you understand that we are allowing things in society today and allowing people to, be exp to express themselves? How long before the first person wins a court case 
as a child molester. Saying, hang on a second. Who are you to judge me and on what basis? Why can I not do it? If he's allowed and he's allowed and he's allowed, why not me? I wonder how long it's going to take before these issues find themselves in court. Because we're on a slippery slope, humanity is. But as the church, we have to agree. There are certain things that are moral that God says are allowed that we still have to fight for. The world has different values. They believe you tell the truth mostly. They believe you should care for older people to some degree. They believe you shouldn't steal or murder a lot. People still believe you shouldn't really litter, so we don't do plastic now. We cut more trees down and we give you those straws that melt in your mouth. That'll probably kill you long before a straw ever would. We're told to do good to others as long as it doesn't inconvenience us ourselves. But for Christians, we have this agreement. God exists. He is the sovereign majesty in heaven. And one day, when we all see him, we will be judged for our actions on earth, whether good or bad. That's it. In Ecclesiastes, we read this in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Now, I want you to agree with me. There's a whole lot of difference between the person who's convinced that this is the truth and the one who doesn't believe it at all. Our job is to believe in the Word of God as the final authority of Scripture. Now, it doesn't mean that all Christians live up to that Word all the time. So be free on that. But we have to agree it is the highest authority. And that when we do drift off, even Jesus' own disciples drifted off, when we do drift off, we come back to him. And we appeal to him, 1 John 1, 9, and he forgives us, and we move back into unity and harmony with him and with others. Because the Lord is the one who keeps us. Are you okay? So that's point number one. Point number two is not only is there the Lord that joins us together, but there is a majesty in the heavens. There is a majesty in the heavens. And we have confidence and we build upon this rock. And when we wake up every single morning, it ought to be from a position of strength because we believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth. Heaven wasn't shaken one bit by what's going on in the world today. Heaven was not affected by what's going on in the world today because he always knew it. God always knew this would happen. He said in the end times there will be wars and rumors of wars and there will be earthquakes and there will be shakings in the heavens and the earth. We are going through shakings in the heavens and the earth. And if you've been reading your Bible, you know it's coming. The Bible has warned us that the last days are going to be terrible. We should know this. We should be prepared for it. Why in this church are we always banging on and on and on about telling people to walk in a personal relationship with Jesus? I have on many times from this pulpit said, what if the day comes when we're not allowed to meet this church? I've said it from this pulpit probably 50 times. And there are those who just sit and, huh? And there are those who took heart and began to develop their relationship with Jesus. Because that is what you have is a relationship with him. And even in the Roman Empire, when the church was banned, they still met in the catacombs. They found ways to meet because there was a value higher than self. And that was that there is a majesty in the heavens who we submit to, who we yield to, whom we surrender to. He is God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And if he made heaven and earth, he can sustain heaven and earth. He holds all power in his hands. He is absolutely almighty. That's point number two. I'm rushing through. Yeah, Yo, amen yourself, whoever said that. <laughs> number three, a throne and a kingdom. Not only is there majesty, but there is a throne and a kingdom. Do you know that creation is a universe? Everything you see about you, from the furthest star that can be picked up by the most powerful telescope, to the tiniest cell seen through a microscope. All things living, all things inorganic, make up what we call the world. And this is a universe. It's one vast single system 
embracing everything in spirit, life, mind, time, space, everything in it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Do you know the Bible teaches these things can't be separated? They're not independent of each other. They're united. They work harmoniously. For those of you who've ever had to research cancer, cancer is a condition in which cells no longer take orders from the rest of the body. They, uh, uh, cancer are, is composed of free cells, and not, uh, like anarchy, anarchic cells. They're not subject to the balance and order of the rest of the cells of the body. They go wild, and in some cases, they bring victims to death. If everything in the world was absolutely independent of each other and free radicals and free agents, we'd have a universal cancer right through a vast universe. So what does God do? He brings everything together. He interlocks them. He makes them interdependent. You know, someone once said, it's even like a stone on the seashore. You go out there and you move a stone. It actually affects the balance of nature. When a baby is born and dies, it literally affects whole people's lives about how things could have been. When a loved person leaves this earth, it creates a massive impact upon many other people. Nothing happens in isolation. Everything is interlocked. Everything depends on each other. And we live in a world today where we're no longer separate continents and separate everything. We are joined together in every way as this virus is showing us. This universe, and uni means one by the way, this universe is one great interlocking system. But it begs this question, if it is one system all working together, begs this question, is there something or someone holding it all together? That's the question that needs to be asked. Because otherwise, there are the free radical cancer cells that are just going to destroy this whole thing. There is a control, and that control is called the throne of God. The universe is controlled from that center. What happens to the human body if it has no central control? It falls flat. Every creature, every all of creation has a head on which everything else rests. Or there's no cooperation, no life, no coordination. Even worldly organizations have to have a head. If you organize anything, there's going to be a head or a leader. Even if you organize like a, a woman's book club, where you have coffee and tea and you discuss the latest book, someone's got to lead it. Come on. In a country, you've got a president. The president needs to preside. It goes from the family unit to the largest empire that ever touched the world. Everything has a head. So if everything else has a head, isn't it logical to believe that there is one who holds everything in his hand? And for us, that is God the thro on the throne. He is the majesty in heaven, and he holds all things under his control. From that throne, God governs the universe according to an eternal purpose. And I want to tell you something. The eternal purpose of God covers all things. Now, that's two very simple little words, all things. But all things are two little words used often in the scriptures, but they're bigger than the sky because they contain all things. And all things means all things. We have someone sitting upon the majesty of heaven. He sits upon his throne and he holds all things together. Point number four, there's someone sitting next to him on the right hand of that throne. Why? Who is he? He is Jesus Christ the servant and the minister in the sanctuary. Why is he there? What's he there for? What did he do? Well, if you like, this little rolling ball called planet Earth, this little blue planet, is like a province of the universe. You know what we did? We staged a revolt. Because never mind there's a majesty in heaven, never mind he controls all things, we did not want to come under God's authority. We wanted to be like God. So we revolted, didn't we? That's why we say to each other, you are revolting. <laughs> we don't want to be ruled by the head. We don't want to be ruled by the throne. Like the Tower of Babel, we want to control everything ourselves. We're a little province called mankind. I mean, people are always asking, do, exist, do people like us exist anywhere else? That's why we've sent astronauts up, unless you're one of those who believe it was a studio in Hollywood. But we sent astronauts up to go and look to see, oh, is there life on Mars? Is there life everywhere else? 
I, well, I don't know, but mankind probably doesn't exist anywhere else because the scripture says that the earth has been given to the sons of men. The earth has. The earth belongs to man. Look, we haven't done very much with it, and we've done a very good job of stuffing it up, but it does belong to us. It is our planet. And so this province of ours is in revolt against the majesty of the heavens. And so number five, what's God going to do about it? I mean, do you believe that God just could have said, you know what, this project failed? Like a Twinkies wrapper. <laughs> Throw it away. Of course he could. Just sweep us out of existence. But he didn't. He sent his only begotten son. That he could redeem that province to bring it back to himself. Bring it back into the sphere of his throne room and his authority. And that throne room and that authority is called the kingdom of God. And when a person is born again or saved or converted or whatever language you want to use, you know what happens? They become again a member of that kingdom of God. It means we're born out of the old rebellious province that didn't want God as king. We're brought into the new kingdom. And listen here, when you're brought into the new kingdom, one of the first things you admit is that that kingdom has a throne and you're not on it. So that someone else is on that throne and you surrender to the king of that throne. I want to tell you that no sinner on planet earth admits to the throne of God as being valid. Nobody admits to the throne of God having the right to rule over him. We can talk about God, we can appeal to God, we can use his name in vain, but they will not obey God. They won't do it. And that's why we're sinners. And that's why the Bible says you will perish in your sin unless you're born again. But when a person repents, what happens? They leave the old world. They leave the old province that revolted. And they come into the kingdom of God. And they come under the rulership of God. It's as simple as that. That's our story. I said at church this morning, and I mean, if I thought people would be scared of coronavirus. We were packed out this morning. But I want to say this. Long before we fear coronavirus, we need to fear the Lord. We need to respect Him again. We need to understand that you don't get into that kingdom by being baptized, although we all need to be baptized. You don't get into that kingdom by joining a church, although you must join a church. You don't get into that kingdom by praying, although it's good to pray. It's an act of the will through Jesus Christ where you surrender to His Lordship and He gets you out of the old revolted province and He moves you into the kingdom of God and He puts you square under the throne of God where you learn to submit. And I said this morning, people fear the coronavirus. That is the least of our worries. This planet has far more to worry about. Number six, who is Jesus? I've got 10 statements. He is the one who returns us to the kingdom. He is the one who returns us to the kingdom. You know, the Bible says God became man to rescue sinful man. He forfeited his own life that he could rescue humanity. And this Jesus now sits at the right hand of the throne of heaven. Acts 2 verse 22 talks about the essence of Christianity. Acts 2 22, and this is what it says. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That is the essence of our story. I carry on in verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. I say it again, there is a throne. And on that throne is Jesus Christ who identified with us. In a sense, you could say, one of us. And Christianity says you can come back to the kingdom through him who sits on the throne. Number seven of ten statements. This is what excited and motivated the early church. They weren't excited about social issues and political issues and industrial questions. And today, the, you know, the church up till recently, up, I think up until last week, the church has been trying to dominate government, trying to dominate society, trying to trying to rule the roost as it would. 
we have forgotten our role. We are trying to put moral laws on people instead of explaining to them their need for Jesus Christ. We're trying to dominate the natural order instead of serving her with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've tried to become too self-important, trying to take care of people's needs, forgetting the biggest need they have, the need to be reconciled back to God through Christ. But you know, the early church, baptized with the Holy Spirit, they were excited about a few things. And I believe by the Holy Spirit tonight, there are things we need to get excited about. Number one, we need to get excited again that God's on the throne. I mean, this is the first time in living memory that all sports events around the world has been canceled. Isn't it? You can't get on TV and watch sports events right now. But let me tell you something. God is on the throne. And now you don't have anything to distract you. You can read your Bible, you can pray, you can phone a couple of friends from church, you can get together, have a bride, witness to each other, tell each other about what Jesus has done. We can fellowship. God in His kindness is taking the distractions away that we can remember who is on the throne. We forget that before the entertainment age, 100 years ago, you lit a candle. You spent time with each other. You went to bed at a reasonable hour. Midnight was the middle of the night. Now it's when you turn your lights off at 12 o'clock. But it used to be the middle of the night. And we invested in one another. Then we got clever and we made little machines, washing machines and tumble dryers and dishwashers. We made those machines to make our time easier. What did we do? We got all those things, we put them to work, and while they're doing that, we spent even more time doing other stuff instead of resting. Selah. S-E-L-A-H. Instead of resting, instead of Sabbathing, Instead of making time for what's important, we just kept on having our time chewed up. And isn't it wonderful that right now, in the midst of chaos, the Lord says, get excited again that I'm on my throne. You church, get excited again. Stop looking at the distractions. They were excited about God on the throne. They were excited about Jesus at the right hand of God. They were excited that Jesus is coming again. Thank you. Number three, they were excited about the outpouring and the ministry of the Holy Spirit upon the church. Now suddenly we can invest time this week, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, investing in the presence of God. I'm willing to bet we've got leaders in this church who wouldn't be bothered to be here on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night because they're so busy with their own lives and their own opinions and their own everything else. Instead of bowing the knee in humility before a king who's on the throne, And instead of crying out for our city and crying out for those, I tell you, the Bible says watch and pray. We are not watching and praying. We are not watchful at the moment. The church is as busy as the world. We're supposed to be on a different time. We're supposed to be operating from the leading of the Holy Spirit, being effective instead of our lives being wasted and washed away. I called the church to pray. And to fast like we do two or three times a year. I'm trusting God is going to visit us by His Spirit. I'm trusting we're going to have outpouring and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you remember what I said to you this morning. There are times of the manifestation of the conscious presence of God. But every time in Scripture there was a manifestation of the conscious presence of God, thereafter followed times of trial, times of tribulation, times of great difficulty. In every recorded incident in the Bible where the conscious presence of God broke out, difficult times followed. Because we live by faith and not by sight. And when there are outpourings of the Spirit in front of you, there's no faith there. It's called sight because you can see it. And you remember, I told you the story of Jacob. He had one dream, probably 20 minutes, and he had one night of wrestling with God. The rest of his life is characterized by a faith walk where there weren't ladders going up and down. And we need a church able to walk by faith and not by sight because faith pleases God and not sight. And we need to remember that although God will break out and God will break out miraculously and people need that, we need to understand that we are a people who rely on the outpouring and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the reason the Holy Spirit came was to reveal Jesus. Ultimately, any ministry and outpouring and working of the Holy Spirit will be to reveal people to Jesus, uh, to reveal Jesus to people and to make people more like Jesus. He will bring the kingdom of God to bear. He will reveal the truth of the kingdom of God. That is when it's the Holy Spirit. And you know what the early church did? They got excited about that. 
I'm telling you the greatest manifestation about the Holy Spirit can be when a person's heart breaks for the things of God. When a person's heart realizes how far they are from Him. I know that day I gave my life to Jesus and put my hand up. No man on earth could have changed me on that day. It was the Spirit of God. The greatest miracle I could ever have had. Fourth thing they got excited about was the consummation of all things. Do you know, sorry, why is everything off? Is it just me? Every door's closed, every window's closed, and everything's off. I'm dying in here. Put, someone do something. Open windows, open a door, put a fan on, do something. This light's killing me. Thank you. Because I'm preaching up a storm here. All right. So they talked about the consummation of all things. Are you looking forward to a world where there is no more evil, no more pain, no more sin? When God cleanses this planet, when he literally burns it up and starts again and puts a new heavens and a new earth? I'm excited. A world without tears and pain. The cleansing of this world. No more evil allowed. I long for the day of joy and gladness and peace and happiness. We don't have to fight anymore. They were intoxicated with the ideas of the glorified Jesus who was coming back. That he would come back in the clouds. I mean, now, of course, everyone believes he's coming back next week. But he is going to come back soon. We all get that. I mean, he's 2,000 years closer. Believe me, he is coming and you know what? When he comes, it's all over. And we have this opportunity to do the best with what we've got. We have an opportunity to rave to the world about the privilege of Jesus. We should be ablaze with these things. Man, we've got a story to tell. Number nine. Number eight. The God-man. Now the Bible says Jesus was fully man and fully God. I mean, how can a thing be a horse and not a horse? But Jesus is fully man and fully God. Why is that important to us? Because 1 Timothy 2.5 says there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We worship this man as God. The early church believed he's God, they worshiped him as God. Why is that important to us? Because do you know, if you were given a vision right now, let's say you could for the next 24 hours, whoop, you're gone and you're in heaven. I just want to ask you, what are you going to see there? You're going to see creatures that exhaust human comprehension. Do you know when you get to heaven, there's going to be six-winged creatures? Now, every bird or anything you've ever seen has got two. One on the left and one on the right. And they flip together because if they don't, there's a stuff up. How six-winged creatures going to look? Not only that, there's going to be creatures with wheels in the middle of wheels coming out of fire. You know, look at that. Not only that, there are broad-winged angels. There are seraphim that burn. There are four-headed creatures. Listen here. When you get to heaven, you're not going to feel like you fit in. Doesn't matter how weird your neighbor thinks you are right now. You are normal compared to what's happening there. Because the things we'll see on that side defy everything known this side of glory. And you're going to look around. I mean, if you can't see other humans, and even if you could see God, what does the Bible say about him? He is in unapproachable fire. There's light. You're just like, is that God? Yes, it's God. God is spirit. You worship him in spirit and truth. The Holy Spirit is spirit. And there's all these creatures. You're going to be the one that you will look like a freak. Not them. And you're going to be panic stations and you're going to look around. And you know what you're going to see? You're going to see someone who looks like you. You're going to see one person who looks like you. The son of man. And you're going to be encouraged because it's going to be Jesus. He's going to be just like you, but without sin. And you finally will look in heaven and say, yes, there's someone just like me. And he is the sinless one. The one who died on your behalf. The one who knows you better than anybody else. Jesus, the son of man. Jesus, the son of God. Who will welcome you as one of his own. And he says this about you. You're my brother and you're my sister. And he identifies with you. And those creatures that are so holy and so amazing to look at, you will be elevated above them. Because that man, Jesus Christ, that God-man, shed his blood for you and not for them. That is the high priest who sits at the right hand of the Father. It's wonderful to see someone just like you, isn't it? I remember once I was traveling through Italy, through Milan at the airport. 
and there's all these people in these dark suits, and there was one guy in a blue bull's outfit. And he had a hat with horns on, and I knew for a fact he came from South Africa. And I know I could have gone to that oak, and I could have spoken to him in Afrikaans, and he probably had biltong in his bag. And I felt for a moment I identify with that man. How will it be in heaven one day when you will see him? Because the archangels don't speak your language. Cherubim, seraphim don't speak your language, but Jesus does. And what's he doing up there? He stands before the Father pleading your case before the Father's throne. You see, I need you to understand that it is Jesus who became man who is the one who represents us. Because God the Father in heaven, if we denounce that God's in heaven, how's that victorious to the world? Because we all know that God's victorious. He holds the whole world in His hands. He's supernatural. God's everything. Why is that good news to us? What's good news to us is when God becomes a man and lives like us and lives successfully, lives without sin and takes our sin upon Himself, that's a story worth sharing. Which leads to number nine. We are reunited with God through Christ. I want to tell you, and I want to close with this, we are literally living on the very outskirts. We're living on the outer margins of the kingdom of God. We are in, but I'm telling you now, we're playing on the back door. We are not fully in yet. You know, the Bible says that we've been joined with Christ. We are seated with Christ, Colossians says, in heavenly places. I want to remind you that our nature has been joined to God's nature in the mystery of the incarnation. When Jesus died on that cross and rose again, he joined individual Christians to his body. He meant us to have the same victory he had. When he died on that cross and said, it is done, it is finished, he meant it for you and I. We are not just sinners who 40 years after serving Christ are still just useless sinners who believe in Jesus. The Bible says we are busy being transformed. We are changing One day I want to be a grandfather and I want my kids and I want my grandkids to look at me and I want them to say, man, dad's dad or grandpa is like Jesus. I don't want them to say, I wish he goes to a retirement home. I'm so over his bad moods. I want my grandkids and I want my kids to say, dad is always an example to me of what Jesus looks like. That's what I'm aiming for. Because they see me outside of church. We've been joined to him. Do you know we have the same high privileges as Jesus has at, the God's, at God's right hand? John 17, 23 says, I in them and you in me. May they be brought into complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and you've loved them even as you have loved me. One of the primary reasons Jesus came to this earth was to communicate to unbelieving people that they matter to the heart of God. That unbelieving people count when it comes to God. They are not disqualified. And we as Christians are there because of the absolute worthiness of Jesus, not because of any intrinsic worthiness of our own. He is the representative of us before God. He is the model behind which you and I are patterned. That's why the Lord won't leave you alone. He wants us to change our lives. Number 10 and lastly, and I'm done. I want to encourage you on the basis of everything I've said. Why don't you, one of these days, get up and allow the power of God to come on you? Why don't you, one of these days, just get up. Stop making excuses for your life. Stop moaning and being grumbly about everything. And why don't you one day have the courage to allow the power of God to come inside you, to change you, And to bless you. Brett called it in worship, crossing the chicken line. It's far more than that, but it's a good point. Allow God to shift you to a place where we look at you and say, man, my goal in life, I want to be like you. Like Paul wrote at the end of his life and said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can I be honest? I know I don't look it, but I'm 50 next year. The big five zero. And I'm going to be one of those one day who buys a car the same color as my hair. And I'm going to be one of those who drives like this thinking, man, the world's going too fast and it's only 50 k's an hour. And I might be the guy with a hearing aid going, that I can't hear anybody else. 
But can I say this? I want my life to be an example of what a life looks like that Jesus can own absolutely. And I want my kids and I want my grandkids and I want people around me to look at me one day and say, man, I want to imitate Greg as he imitates Jesus. Which means I absolutely reject the notions that I'm going to become a bitter pill the older I get. I want to believe that inwardly I'm being renewed day by day. I want to believe that people who know me best would know I'm becoming more like Jesus now than I ever have before. I don't know if that's true, but I want it to be true. And I want it to be true over my life. And I tell you what, I want to get up and allow the power of God to come upon me. And I want to allow God to change me, and I want to allow God to bless me. Jesus says in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, which also means everybody can come to the Father through him. Everybody. We're all welcome. I want to ask you, why don't you begin right now? Why don't you move into the heart of God? Why don't you lean into Him tonight? Why don't you live victoriously? You have a great high priest. And the revolt of man has been overturned by the redemption brought for us by the eternal Son of God. He has paved the way into his presence. And he never backs off when man revolts. As a matter of fact, as an incredible father, he runs after us. Day after day after day. I believe we should be seeking the face of God with all our hearts. And truly going after him with everything in us. It's all we have. Stand with me, please.